here we are. And as you know, you've heard me uh, preach for any length of time, you know that at the beginning of the year, it's a time where I always like to um, take stock, reflect on the year that's gone and look ahead um, and to refocus, to re-motivate, and most important, recommit to what God is calling me to do. And certainly, it's uh, a time is needed to do that more than ever. I mean, we were in very challenging and unusual times. I think we can all agree with that. And we've talked a lot about that. We face many challenges and things law, that we're not experienced before, really. And um, an observation that I've had, and it's quite sad, really, is that I think there are a number of Christians, not us, but there are a number of Christians that are a bit discouraged, that are maybe confused, or worse, even fearful. Uh, but not us. We're the, we're the people of faith. Amen. And uh, while disturbing things are certainly happening all around us, we're, we're not to be afraid. I love, I love that the Bible uses that term, do not be afraid or do not fear. At least 365 times it's mentioned in the Bible. It's one for, one for each day of the year. It's not a place we want to be. We have no need to fear, no matter what's happening around us. We've we got a big God, and uh, he's got our back. Amen? So, while we don't need to fear, we certainly do need to prepare. We are living in end times. We are living in, in, in exciting days, and we need to be aware and prepared. We just can't cruise on through. I believe the days ahead are good. I, I believe this is potentially the church's finest hour, and the potential for us as, as the people of God is amazing. And despite all the ungodly things we perhaps see around us, um, God's not discouraged. He's not confused. He's not worried. And he's certainly not fearful. You know, his plans for us are still for good and not for evil. They're still for our hope and for a future. Amen. And he's very much in control, even in these turbulent times where we can't necessarily understand why and what's happening. But we know that God is still on his throne. And we need to trust him. And as Proverbs says, we lean not on our own understanding. We acknowledge him in all our ways and he directs our paths. We walk by faith in the one who is faithful. Amen. So it's um, more important though, as Pastor was preaching on last week, to uh, follow the, the presence of the Lord, to follow the leading of the Spirit, walking close with Jesus, and um, so that we can avoid discouragement and deception and stay safe in our place of salvation. Amen. So we need to stay focused. We need to stay connected to God, to each other, and we need to stay on course. And that's the title of my message this morning. I'm going to continue next week. So it's a two-part, uh, staying on course. So let's pray and commit our time to the Lord. Father, we uh, do once again want to thank you, Lord, for your word. We want to thank you for your presence here, Holy Spirit, to uh, take the word and make it alive, bring revelation to us, to encourage us, to build us up in our most holy faith. Father, we thank you. We commit our time into your hands this morning. And we thank you that you're speaking to each and every one of us, Lord, that you are empowering us and encourage us, that your word is life to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, title of my message, Staying on Course. Fear, discouragement, deception. These are all things, actually, that can take us off course. And as I said, we've no, uh, no need to be fearful. We, uh, we're in exciting times. We're not far away, we believe, from the rapture of the church. But as I say, the times are challenging, and so we need to use our faith like never before. And certainly we don't want to be discouraged. Very important to stay positive, to be hopeful, to keep our confidence in God. He never lets us down. Amen. And we need to guard against deception. And we've talked quite a bit about this, if a number of messages prior to Christmas. In fact, I spoke one myself, and a pastor's been talking about it at all. There's just so much information out there. Uh, in the times that we're currently uh, living in. And, and Jesus told us quite clearly in Matthew 24, when the disciples were asking him, what are the, the signs of the times and you're coming? And the first thing he said is, watch out that no one deceives you. Deception is one of the key things. And uh, it's, uh, truth is so important. And of course, uh, our primary source of truth is not the media, it's not the government, it's the Word of God. Remember John 8. 31 and 32, when Jesus was speaking to the disciples. And he says, if you hold to my teaching, where's his teaching? It's in the word. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So in these days when 
God's instructions for, for living, as I say, biblical principles are being ignored, even ridiculed. It's a real challenge for us to say true to His Word. So we need to be continually in the Word. We, I know we talk about this a lot, but it is so important. Filling ourselves with God's truth, having our minds renewed, our faith built up, so we're not deceived, so that we're not taken off course. Discouragement, deception. They are certainly knocking at the door and threats that we have to um, avoid and overcome. But today I want to talk about another important matter that we need to be aware of that also starts with the letter D, and that's called distraction. A little bit more subtle distraction, even again, but uh, still nevertheless, something we need to guard against church. See, like discouragement and, and deception, it's quite often we don't realize it. We can get caught up in the issues of life, the general busyness of life, I guess, that we uh, take our eyes off what is really important as our lives as Christians. And it's one of the devil's key tactics, I've found in my Christian life anyway, to keep us um, ineffective, to try to distract us with less important, even negative, or temptations, to, uh, so that we don't stay on course with what God is requiring from us. These are not times to be wandering off course, to be distracted. We need to stay committed, we need to stay focused, and we need to complete our race. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he uh, wrote his many letters in the New Testament, often referred to the, the Christian life as a, a race. And um, he was writing here to the church at Philippi about this. Now, they'd been doing okay, just as I think we're doing okay. I mean, there's not a huge problem. I think we're going, we're tracking our well, doing, God's doing great things in our lives, through our lives. Um, they'd been doing okay, but he wanted to encourage them and continue to remind them, and I guess that's where I'm coming from this morning, for them to persevere in their commitment to Jesus. We can sing songs about it, that's one good thing, and it's a good thing, but you know, it's what we do, it's how we live our lives is the more important thing. So let's have a look here. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 16. He says, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too, God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. See, we're not at the end yet. We might be getting close, but we're not at the end yet. And we're on track, but we need to continue to press on. No matter what has happened or is happening around us, we need to stay on course. We need to keep that eternal perspective, our eyes on the goal. Paul says here, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul suffered a lot of setbacks, a lot of hardships. He had many problems, but the one thing about his ministry, he kept going, he kept going, he kept going, he never gave up. And we too can have challenges, and we all do that. We live in a, in a fallen world. But no matter what we're facing, our future is guaranteed. What a comfort. What a comfort to know that. However, it still requires some effort and some discipline, you know that, to uh, successfully navigate life, to stay on course. Let us live up, he so goes on to say, to what we've already attained. I don't know about you, I've been a Christian a while and I've sown too much into the kingdom. I've worked too hard, I've sacrificed too much, I've given too much, as many of you have done over the years, been faithful the service of the master and we certainly don't want to blow it now do we <laughs> sadly some do as I said Paul often speaks about the Christian life being like a race another passage of scripture that reflects this is the second Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 and 8 where he says I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but to also to all 
who have longed for his appearing. At the end of his ministry, Paul could say with confidence that he'd fought the good fight, he'd finished his race, he'd kept the faith, he'd completed his race. And the same applies to us. We need to continue to fight the good fight. Finish the race, keep the faith. And then also when it's our time to be with Jesus in heaven and come before the reward seat of Christ, we receive our, our crown. You know, it's often said it's not uh, how you start your race, it's how you finish, isn't it? And so, um, well, I reckon we're, we're just about in the finishing straight and it's certainly not a time to drop the baton now. We've got to keep going to the end. So today I want to talk particularly about, I guess, distraction can hinder us in, uh, in completing God's race as per his will for our lives. Now, distraction, I think we all know what distraction means, but it, it's something that prevents us from concentrating on what we would like to be doing or what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, something that takes our attention away from what we're meant to be doing. Distraction. And in the Christian sense, it's uh, sort of a distracted from our relationship with God, I guess is the, one of the most important things. Distracted from spending time in his word. Distracted from doing what he's actually called us to do. Distracted from serving him. Distracted from being in fellowship with one another. Distracted from evangelizing the lost. As I say, we can't afford to be distracted. We need to stay on course, finish our race. And distractions, of course, are everywhere. And they're not all necessarily bad. It's life to a degree. See, I'm not talking about, um, you know, normal little, little distractions like the other day we had a barbecue, you know, and I mean, you could be cooking the sausages, you get distracted, and the next thing the sausages are burnt. They're everyday distractions. I'm not talking about that. In fact, we had a barbecue the other day, and um, I uh, had some guests who were, thought them foodies, you know, people really understood good food. And so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll bring out the fillet steak. So I had this big piece of fillet steak, prime steak, very expensive. I mean, isn't the price of meat wicked, eh? In a country that has grown so much, has so much uh, livestock. Anyway, that's another story. I got my fillet steak and I pre prepared it. I started to cook it on the barbecue and I just wanted it right. You know, it's supposed to be served medium rare. And uh, so, you know, you've got to watch it. But of course, our friends are there and you're talking and you're getting distracted talking with them. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but I got distracted from my fillet steak, from my very expensive fillet steak. And it stayed on the barbecue a little bit too long. And I was very disappointed. Oh, it was still okay, but it was a, a, well, got a good medium by the time uh, we managed to uh, cut into it and eat it. So I was a bit disappointed about that. So we have distractions like that. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, and, you know, they're not necessary life-changing or threatening. So life, distractions are part of life. In fact, I could be quite sure that even standing here talking to you now, there's a few of you, your minds are distracted and you're thinking about something else rather than listening to me. <laughs> We've all done that. I do it. Praise and worship. You're praising worship. You're praising the Lord. Next thing you're thinking about something completely different. Oh, no, sorry, God, I'm supposed to be worshipping you. Who's done that? Come on, be honest now. You know what I'm talking about. Okay. But what we're talking about here are distractions that hinder us from living a productive and successful Christian life. Distractions and influences that take us and can take us off course, even out of the race. We want to stay in God's perfect will for our lives. And, you know, that's a place where we need to live. It's a place of peace. It's the place of security. It's the place where, of provision and protection. And also we want to please him and honor him by living life the way he requires it. We give him our heart. It's more than just words. Live life the way he wants it. And distractions can hinder us doing this. And we don't, seem, we don't set out to get distracted. No one does. It just seems to happen, doesn't it? Um, we mean well, but things come up that get in our way that take our attention from what we should be doing. And many times they're good things, but they're not necessarily the right thing or the best thing. And as I said before, the main thing the devil wants to distract us from is our relationship with God, which, of course, that is foundational to the key to us staying on course. And we should always put our relationship with God first and every day make an effort to hear him from him and be following the Holy Spirit. Walking every day with Jesus is a good saying, isn't it? Following him, obeying him, putting him first. And Jesus made this very clear, very on in his ministry, when he was calling 
the first disciples. Now, remember, he'd already appointed the 12 disciples, and um, he was looking for more. And he was getting ready to appoint another 72. We can read about that in Luke chapter 9 and 10. Anyway, a number of volunteers seem to have come forward. So let's pick up the story here in Luke 9, 59 and 62 to 62. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I thought, when I first read that, I thought, man, that's a bit tough, Jesus. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't seem too you know, unreasonable. It seemed reasonably valid, um, what they were wanting to do. But you see, in this instance, Jesus was requiring immediate obedience because they're calling. Think about it, it was so important. He didn't mince his words. He wanted followers that would do exactly what he asked, when he asked. And I often worried, let the dead bury the dead. You know, sometimes you're reading something and there's the, the major theme of the scripture and then you get some saying and you don't really understand it. Well, here's the thing, church. I'll just move out to the side here for a minute. If you see something in scripture you don't understand, and what a great opportunity to do some research and understand what does he really mean by this? I looked at the dead bury the dead. How can a dead bury dead? It didn't seem to make sense to me. So um, uh, I did some research. And what that means is that um, he's referring to the people of this world the Bible says that we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. Well, they're dead to Christ because they're still in their sin. So we're talking about spiritually dead people. Okay? Um, uh, they don't know Jesus. They have no desire to follow him. So let them attend to the earthly things. But these guys, he was saying, hey, you've got a higher calling here. That was the principle that was born out brought out here. And there may be that guy in, those, in Jewish tradition in those days, the oldest son generally had to stay with the father to bury him and do all that needed to be done to make sure he got his inheritance. So maybe he was, you know, had a, had a good reason to do it. In any event, Jesus' answer made it clear that um, if, he, if his request to go and do that, bury his father, it involved putting tradition and his own desires ahead of serving Jesus. And the same way with the other man, it sounded reasonable. Family are important. He wanted to say goodbye to his parents. And the Bible's full of the principle of, you know, honouring honoring our family, particularly our parents. Um, but, you know, sometimes parents, family, cultural expectations can get in the way of what God is calling us to do. Actually, this is, can actually be a real problem for a lot of Christians. Their families can put huge demand on you. So there's, boundaries are important. This message for another day. But um, we've got to keep things in balance in terms of our, how we organize our time and our, uh, our efforts. So as I say, the things that these men wanted to do seemed valid, but they were a distraction to what Jesus was requiring. They weren't nearly as important as his requirement to follow them and become a disciple and follow him. Now, the first 12 that were called realized this. Straight away. I suppose that's why they've got a sort of special place in Scripture. You remember when uh, Jesus was walking along the, the shores of Lake Galilee and he, he came to uh, Peter and Andrew, the brothers, the fishermen who were there. And this is the calling of the first disciples. And um, they recognized him at once. And they followed him at once. We read about it in Matthew 4, verses um, 19 and 20. And Jesus said to them, talking to Peter and Andrew, he said, come, follow me. And at once... They left their nets and followed him. And as they dropped everything, they would have been in the middle of stuff just like we are. But they heard the master's call. At once, they left their nets and followed him. And then walking on a little bit further, he comes upon the brothers James and John, also fishermen. And in verse 22, Jesus called them. And immediately, everyone say immediately. Immediately, immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. See, these situations aren't necessarily applicable to us today, but the principle is, the principle is, when God us, asks us to do something, we don't always have to think about it. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we need to pray about it. We need to make sure it's the voice of the Lord. But sometimes we don't have to think about it. We just need to obey. See, it's not a matter of fitting God into our schedule, but us following his schedule. 
And in these days particularly, we need to be hearing and responding to the voice of the Lord. We can't afford to be distracted. We need to remain focused on what God is calling us to do. See, distraction comes in many forms and it can come from many directions. But the result is generally the same. It takes us off course. It either prevents us experiencing something that God has for us or it stops us doing something that he wants to do. I'll repeat that. Distraction can take us off course. It can prevent us from experiencing something that God has for us or stop us doing something that he wants us to do. And um, distractions can be very obvious or they can be very subtle. They, see, they can be seemingly trivial situations or, 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 or major life-changing situations. And I'll, I'll give an example of one of those later. Um, everyday things. For instance, you know, it's your prayer time or you've been stirred to pray and the phone rings or you get a, a little email alert or a Facebook alert, a message coming up. You think, oh, I'll just check that. I'll just check that. Better, better check that. It could be important. So you check that. And then you think, oh, my goodness, yes, okay. Oh, well, I better reply now. So you reply that. And then they, re- oh, well, what are they going to say back? So they reply and on, et cetera, et cetera. Next thing you know, oh, my goodness, I've got to go now. Distraction that stopped you praying about something significant. Okay, we've all experienced that. Come on. It could be harmless. But it, as I say, it could also be stopping you praying by the leading of the Spirit for something of far higher value. What about you planning to go to church? Someone rings up and invites you to go out. You could be missing a word that God has for you. A revelation, life-changing word. These are little everyday distractions that we need to be aware of. They could be harmless, sure. But are we really putting Jesus first? Or are we just fitting him in? Good example here in the story of Martha and Mary. And you all know the story well, but let's have a look at it again this morning. Luke 10 Verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. Everyone say distracted. Distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will be not taken away from her. Now, what Martha was doing was good, okay? But Jesus gives us this lesson to show us what is better. See, we don't intentionally get distracted. Martha didn't want to ignore Jesus. It wasn't about that. But it shows that... Does that mean? (laughs) Sorry about that. Um, We don't intentionally want to get distracted. As I say, Martha didn't want to ignore Jesus. But sometimes it shows that what is valid, worthwhile, and needs doing can actually keep us from doing what God wants us to do. It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter of priorities. Mary prized the time with Jesus and gave her entire focus to his presence. And when Martha complains to Jesus, he gently reminds her of what her focus should be on, building a relationship with him. Yes, Martha was showing wonderful hospitality, welcoming Jesus and his disciples, but she was distracted from the more important thing. And some of us need to be, I know, for me, absolutely, you need to stop rushing around sometimes and worrying and getting on trying to do all the things that life demands of us and take a seat like Mary did. Amen? So while Jesus is not here physically like he was with them, uh, we still need to avoid the busyness, the distractions that can particularly stop us spending time with him. So important to spend time with the Lord, to develop our relationship with him. And of course, our connection mainly these days is done through prayer. And how often are we distracted from prayer? I'll do it later. Oh, I've got this to do. It can wait. It requires discipline, church. It requires discipline. It requires discipline to stay on course. And that's why it's important to set time aside every day. If you don't make it a habit, lock it in. Um, 
it won't happen. Time praying, time in the word. I do it first thing in the morning. I, uh, I find that for me, that's how I want to start the day. I want to commit the day to the Lord. I want to be, get on track with it. So hopefully I'm following the leading of the Spirit, hearing from Him all day. Um, so that's when I do it, first thing in the morning. It's a distraction. <laughs> Just lock in. <laughs> oh, I was distracting me. So uh, let alone you guys. Okay. So these are small distractions, not necessarily wrong, but there are bigger distractions that we need to watch out for. You recall in the Gospels, uh, the parable of the sower, where Jesus was talking about his word, and he likened the word to a seed. And he talked about the different types of soil, remember, that the, the seed could be planted into. And depending on the type of soil and what was going on with that soil, would be it was a sort of an example of the fruit that it produced. And of course, we we're all called to produce fruit for the Lord. And anyway, he gets to the... Um, to the soil where it had the thorns. And he describes the thorns as representing the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things. Let's read about it. Mark 4.19. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Here we see three main distractions that um, we have to deal with. Worries of life, deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things. These are biggies and they can consume our lives. What we need, what we have to do, getting ahead, making money, having nice things, having a good time, the needs of our family, our health, our job, our sports, our hobbies. These things can all distract us from being fruitful for the master. And Jesus knew this. And so he addressed this in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount must be one of the greatest passages of Scripture. Runs over about three chapters in the New Testament and uh, provides some of the absolute basic tenets for Christian living. Let's pick it up, though, here, particularly in Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 to 34. It says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, about your body or what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, gone tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, possessing material riches is not a problem. Well, it's not bad. We need money. We need to eat. We need clothes. We need a place to live. In fact, God wants us to prosper. But when we put our trust in them, and they take priority over our dedication to him, we've got a problem. We've been distracted. We have possessions, wealth, our jobs, our lifestyle become a dominant cause in our life. We've become, become distracted from where our true dedication should be. He also mentioned in that uh, scripture in, in uh, Mark 4, 19, the desire for other things. And in Luke's version of the same scripture, he calls it the pleasures of life. Now, it's natural for us to have desires for certain things. In fact, the Bible says God wants to give us the desires of our hearts. But they need to be good things. Jesus was referring here to desires or pleasures that are not properly controlled. Things that can take too much of our time 
and our attention and take us off course. Desire for things in itself is not wrong. It's how we're, how we're made. It's perfectly natural. It's great to enjoy life, to want good things. Nothing wrong with resting, relaxing, having fun and so on. But when it takes us away for God, from God's will for our lives, we can become ineffective or worse, actually get ourselves into trouble. And in uh, pursuit of these things, I see many people, many people in pursuit of the things of the world, um, they can get so busy that they don't have enough time for God. Worries of life, deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things. These things can all distract us from God's purposes because they demand our attention. They demand our time. They demand our energy. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be given to you. It's priorities, church. Absolute priorities. We put God first. The rest will look after itself because our God is a faithful God. He's a good God. So while these distractions can slow us down and um, potentially take us off course, there are, and I'll just finish with this, more serious distractions that can take us out of the race completely. And uh, I want to look at the example of uh, David and Bathsheba. And this is where distraction comes in the form of temptation, which leads to willful sin. This is when we're in real trouble. 2 Samuel 11, 1. 2 Samuel 11, 1. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David said, sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. And late one afternoon, after his midday rest, he got up out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone out to find who she was. And he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messages to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. Now the king, in this case David, of, a, of an army, of a, of, a, of, a, of a people, would normally go out. It was the practice. The king would go out and lead from the front. He would always go out with his army, as David did throughout Scripture. But this time he got distracted, which in turn led to a bigger distraction and, of course, then temptation. You see, a small distraction may seem harmless. They're not going out to battle. Maybe that, that was okay. But it's where it led was the problem. So David, instead of going out to battle, as he was supposed to, he stayed home. And he saw the beautiful woman. Temptation presented itself. Lust developed in his heart. And his carnal desire took over from what he knew was right. And he pursued the woman. And he committed a serious sin. Now, we haven't got time to go into it now. But he paid a huge price for that distraction. A huge price for his actions. You see, if David had gone out to war as he was supposed to, this never would have happened. He was distracted by the temptation of pleasure, of lust, and he sinned. He blew it big time. And certainly we don't want to ever get distracted to that degree. That certainly can not only take us off course, it can take us out of the race completely. But fortunately for David... It didn't completely take him out of the race. It certainly took him well off course and it cost him dearly, as I said. But God, through his grace and his mercy, still used him mightily. And um, the saving grace is for us that even if we do go off course, if we do drop the ball, there's no condemnation. As long as we get back on track. Of course, we need to repent. We need to put things right. The one thing we should never do is give up. God will never give up on us. He's a gracious God. So I want to encourage you this morning not to condemn you at all. Just be aware. These little things, the little foxes, spoil the vine. And so we need to be aware of distracted. They're all around us. We need to guard against them. So let's make sure that we're not distracted, particularly from our relationship with God, from our calling. Let us keep our eyes on, on what's really important. Not a time to wander off course, church. We need to stay committed, following and obeying Jesus so that we can complete our race. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.
www.ncrc.nz. We'll see you again soon.